Hi, welcome to this edition of Mugs and Hugs. I'm Heidi Marlinghouse. And I'm Jennifer Osger. And today we're featuring Rebecca Cecil. Hi, everybody. Hey, nice to meet you. Nice to yeah. meet you. It's great to have you on today, Rebecca. Um, hey, we're going to jump right into our, our fast five questions. We actually do one question for introduction, and then we've got these fast five that we love because it helps us dig in deep real quick. Um, if someone was to look you up on the internet, what would they find? They would find that I'm a math nerd, and they would find that I am passionate about teaching kids to grow their brain and um become a whole person like I always think of it as like therapy through math like it's okay to make mistakes it's okay to grow and stretch math is a place that you can feel safe um, to be who you are and to say I don't know and to get help from your friends and um, know that the answers lie within you and your friends and not in the teacher so it's empowering uh, I help kids have um, challenged with words today have um, advocacy for themselves and um, take charge of their learning, empower them to be persevere, to persevere and problem solve. Yeah, nice. what's really interesting about that is, you know, I, my time in the classroom, just the last five, six years, I've heard a lot of, you know, that around math specifically, but also in the classroom in general of just being okay with your mistakes and being your own advocate and just a lot of, um, self-confidence and agency, right? right? But it's always been there. Why are, Why is it this big focus now and this big push? How come, why is it that when I was a kid, I, I wasn't taught in a way that I could have that kind of agency that I had more insecurity, you know? So it's just, it's really interesting because math hasn't changed, right? No, but it has. The Common Core came along and it asked kids to think. Mm. It asked teachers to change the way they were teaching because if you look at what happens to kids in eighth grade, they fall off the hill. So they might've gotten straight A's in math because they knew how to just plug in the formulas, right? But in eighth, ninth grade algebra, they're asked to think and they're like, well, I don't know anything. So we, right. we go backwards and we say, you know, I, we start with a real life problem, bring math to your life, whether you're a kindergartner all the way to college age, like here's a math problem and it's about your life because math is everywhere. How would you solve this? Where would you start? If you don't know, that's awesome. That's an opportunity to dig deeper. And if you can look at your mistake and find where you made the, find the mistake and fix it, you've just grown your brain. You're just getting mm -hmm. smarter and smarter. And so studies have shown, because this is the way they teach in Japan, that those kids, they learn less, but they learn to think and problem solve. And they learn to value their mistakes and learn from their dis mistakes and not just like, oh, I made a mistake. Like, where was your mistake? What did you learn from that? What will you do differently next time? And then get a new problem that they don't have the background knowledge for, but they're gonna use what they know to solve that problem. And that just changes the game. Instead of here's a piece of paper, do it. I'm gonna show you how to do it. I do it, you do it, we do it. You know, This is a, here's a problem. I want you to think about it. I want you to talk to a friend about it. I want you to talk to a bunch of friends. And the kids, when I'm teaching, the kids are leading the class. I'm just the conductor. They stand up, they present their ideas, they take questions and comments. A kid might be like, I don't understand what you're doing. And the kid might say, well, I added three plus two because they were both part of the parts and I wanted to find the whole. But isn't the, th and a kid might say, but isn't the three part of the whole? Oh, did I make a mistake? Oh, who else made this mistake? Right, oh my gosh, let me change that. So it creates this, you have to create a class culture where kids feel safe to stand up and say, this is who I am. This is what I'm thinking. Do you guys agree with me or disagree with me? So you're hitting all these different aspects of the child. And those mistakes are celebrated. We cheer, I like, I like to cheer. So after a kid presents their ideas, right or wrong, we give them like a whoop, whoop, good job. And if they present a mistake and they learn from it, they get two cheers. So it's all kind of building into this um, helping kids feel comfortable with themselves, feel comfortable with their mistakes and learn from one another and not look at the teacher for like, not look outside of themselves for someone to save them, but to go, I'm going to, I believe it's in me. And if it, and if I'm feeling a little lost, I know I'm going to go ask my friend because the kids talk to each other instead of the teacher talking to them, they're talking to each other solving. I'm just asking 
questions to make them go deeper. So I, I have a question and um, we're very big, Heidi and I, with strength-based approaches and focusing on the positive to get more of what you want instead of analyzing what you don't want. So I, on some of the mom groups or even in my main feed on Facebook, people like to complain about the new math, right? And, oh, I just, I'm, it kind of goes against my brain, but what do you, what's your opinion of, of that? What would you say to someone who likes to take a picture of what their kid is doing and says, you know, what the heck is this? And why are they doing it that way? And all right. That. So I, I think the disservice we have done as schools and as educators is we've not educated the parents and they feel left out of the equation and they bring the kids bring their homework home and the kids like, this is how we're solving it. And the parents are like, just stack it and add the numbers. And the kids like, I don't want to, I don't understand. And I can't tell you how many parent nights I've done through the different schools that I'm working at where I take the teacher, I take the teachers, I take the, the parents through what their kids are doing in the class with a real life problem and the parents start crying. I cannot tell you it happens every time parents start crying. And a woman said, if I had had access to math this way when I was a kid, I might've done something different with my life. I felt mm -hmm. shut out of so much and it's a lot of women. And you know, studies have shown the girls drop off. And I think, it's a long conversation to have with people. And I do not get into the Facebook kind of war because I know that is not, I'm not going to change their mind. They're feeling frustrated. It's a bigger picture. And I, I would invite them to, um, to come talk to me or have that conversation, but not online because they need to see how we're asking kids to learn, how we're looking for the kids to make sense of things, to make sense of problems parents were never asked. We were never asked to do that. We were just asked, drill and kill, do it, do it, do it. We're saying, what works? What do you understand? Where might you be lost? What parts of this do we have questions about? It's a whole different ball game. And once parents have that education, um, it's a game changer. They're always on my side. I always get more money to be at a school longer. I kid you not, but it's a long conversation and they need to step into their kid's shoes and see the, the why we're doing what we're doing not just the how we're doing it, so. Well, that, I just don't think that it's a new math because I was first introduced to it in college, you know, 26 years ago and it sparked my interest and it was like, oh my gosh, I can actually enjoy math and I can teach math and why wasn't I taught this in grade school? Um, but I'm being taught it now, so that's how I'm gonna teach, right? Right. Um, in addition to that, if you look at like math over history and you look at some of the really big mathematicians over time, they've always thought this way. They didn't think in formulas. Right. right? It's been and, part of their life. It's like they see it in the room where they're at or when they're walking down the street. I mean, there's that one book, I'm trying to remember what it is, um, about a girl who rides her bike and uh, she starts counting sheep because she's dreaming and she was counting sheep to go to sleep. And then she starts counting sheep as she's riding her bike. And then they've got balls of yarn and they've got this and everything she sees is a math problem, right? right. Um, yeah, that, that kind of thinking has always been there. So why is it just considered new now? Well, I think the thinking has always been there and parents when they were young or me when I was young, that's what my mind naturally did. And then I had to transfer what was going into my mm -hmm. mind out into, well, now I'm going to do it the way I've been taught to do it. And we're releasing that. And we're saying, we're not, I want you to come up with the algorithm because it makes sense to you. I want you to discover it. So it is the same, the, the standards are the same. They're still learning the same math. It's just the way that it's being taught now is just completely different. And I know a lot of teachers were resistant to it too, because we didn't get a bunch of training on, Hey, you know, we're, when I, when the common core came, I was lucky enough to be at a school where the principal was, you know, an, an outlier. And she was like, I believe in concept-based learning. And everyone's like, no, we got to do drill and kill. And I was lucky enough to train with these, with Ruth Parker, who does number talks, which is about empowering kids and having them, what they're doing in their brain, come to the page, come to the forefront. And so when the Common Core came, it was an easy fit for me. But I know a lot of teachers who've been in the classroom 25 years who are used to, here's how we do it. Here's your worksheet. Let's do it. Work with me, you know, 
and it's 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 been a challenge for everyone but i think it's you know my daughter is a junior right now and she she's the first kid at the school where i used to work where i was a teacher to start with the common core and she is now in advanced math and that's she wants to do science and math and her thinking about things is kind of revolutionary and she'll go up to her i forget what she's in right now teacher and say, I want to know why this works. And the teacher's like, I don't know. You've just got to put the formula in and go. But she has been trained to think. And she is she struggles with her teachers sometimes. Like, I need to know why this works. And, you know, I can't help her. It's beyond me. I mean, she's beyond me now. I, I have my K-8, you know, and uh, my master's for K-6 math. So it's, it's interesting, but you should keep asking her questions. What do you know? <laughs> What's the problem asking you to do? Where could you start? I love it. Um, you know, as an English teacher, I'm always big on plot and story. And I was never great. Well, I was never great as a student when I was younger, but that's a different story. But specifically for math, <coughs> yeah, it, it just, it was follow these rules and I didn't really gain anything from that. But then all of a sudden I got to geometry and I was like, oh my gosh, I see this. It's like a story, like doing proofs and everything. And, and that was like one of the classes that I thrived in. <laughs> and I was like, it was like, you use the word empowering. I'm like, I, I can do this. Like numbers don't have to beat me. Like I'm, I, you know, I, I formed a new relationship with, with math because maybe it was the teacher too, but it was, um, it was so exciting for me when those doors opened up. Right. Two things about that. We, we, we believe a lot of kids believe, oh, I have the math gene or I don't either. I'm smart or I'm not, you know, this kind of fixed mindset. And when they get to something like geometry, which is spatial, right? So many kids who were the top of the class go to the bottom of the class and the kids who were really struggling all of a sudden they're visual learners. They have that. When I was teaching fourth grade, we used to have, I drank my drink wrong we used to have an overhead projector with like um like tanagrams we'd have to put together i have no spatial reasoning in the whole class i'm like let's look at your teacher practice perseverance i can't figure out i mean i would be up there just demonstrating to them not lying i don't know how to put this thing together this is supposed to become a square can somebody come up and help me and the, you know the struggling kid would come up and all of a sudden chest high shoulders back you know there is there is a place for everyone in math. And that's all I'm hoping we can get there before, you know, the kids find those shapes or find something else. So they know, oh, I'm, this part is easy for me. This part is where I'm gonna grow my brain though. And this is actually really good for me too. Because we want, I wanna find that point where kids bump up. Because everything is, I was one of those kids where everything was easy. I thought I had the math gene, great. Then I got to calculus AP in, in um, high school. And I was like, oh, I, I'm out. I, I, this is foreign language. I got nothing here. Um, and I must be stupid. And I kind of hid that whole year because I never practiced hitting the wall and persevering, right? How can we gain confidence that I am going to persevere? I am going to make mistakes. I am going to then end up better than when I started. But if they don't meet that young, then they, you know, then they're like, done. I, I, I am out. I don't have it. So that's the whole point of pushing everybody. So they meet that wall. Well, so we have, Oh, go ahead, Jen. Oh, I was just going to say like, we haven't even started the questions and already it, I'm just loving this so much. You're I know. Amazing. Uh, we're going to have to figure out how to, how to get to those questions at some point. Hey, there's Chad. Chad, how do you feel about math? You like it? Okay. I'd love to know more about that later. Um, so, uh, what, uh, I had so many thoughts as you were talking, Rebecca, I mean, like right from the get-go and there's no way I can address them all. So the one that I really want to address though, because, uh, Jen and I, one of our main focuses is around social emotional learning, uh, trauma informed, all of that. Um, and you had said that you have to create a safe space and, um, I find that a lot of teachers, they can get the instruction around, you know, this way of thinking in math and this way of teaching math where it's more visual, more hands-on, more problem, problem solving, but they don't know how to create that safe place. 
Right. And they also, you know, inherit these kids who are already competing against each other. Like when I taught fourth and fifth grade, my last, um, my last round of fourth, fifth grade, those kids were so competitive with each other. And I had kids that were learning math at a high school level. I had one kid who was like the national champion for the um, math Olympiad. (laughs) <laughs> all the way down to kids that were like doing math at a second grade level that had, you know, learning differences like dyslexia. So right. now you've got these kids in a room and they're all competing with each other. Like that is not a safe environment um, for them. Right. And so I've heard a lot of teachers, like, how do I create that for these kids who I, I'm not creating a situation where they're competing against each other, but how do I get them out of that mindset and how do I make it feel safe for them? Right. Um, I think, I mean, I, I really believe in morning meeting time. I really believe that's a time to start, you know, start your day looking at each other, saying hello, and then taking, and a lot of teachers will be like, well, I'm going to set my routines and I'm not going to start math for a long time. And I totally disagree because I think the way you structure your problem solving time or you, the way I structure the math class builds in roles, builds in how we're going to communicate with each other, what's appropriate and what's going on. So just a typical teaching through problem solving, it starts with the kids reflecting from what they learned the day before. And I read their journals and I pull those out. So those there's there, and I keep track of who's sharing. Um, But that's an opportunity too, for all levels to get their reflection. And everyone gets a piece of paper that has that kid's reflection. So if You know, Jen is the one who wrote, today I learned that mistakes help me grow my brain. Everybody gets that. Jen stands up, reads it, and we all like applaud and say, yeah, I agree with that too. We glue it and then we glue it into our journal. So now we have Jen, it says Jen, Jen's reflection, and we glue it in. So already we're saying all ideas here are valid. All, and it doesn't matter if you're the top of the class or the bottom of the class. I'm looking for, what do you reflect? Oh, today I realized when you're adding or subtracting a negative number becomes a positive. Great, everybody goes into that, right? And then we, we, we have kids work by themselves and then they work with a partner. And I think during that partner time, it's when it's, and it's heterogeneous. I don't, I, I let the kids pick the partners themselves mostly. And you'll see like a high and a low come together or a medium and medium. And that's a safe place for them to be each other's teachers. And I talk about that. I'm not the teacher, you're the teacher. You need to ask the person with you, I don't understand what you're saying. Can you slow down? What is that number there? I do not understand. And so that high kid who becomes the teacher for the kid, for the other kid is getting a deeper understanding. This person is building their self-esteem because they're with their friend getting taught. Oh, I get it, right? Maybe this person comes up to the board one day and they're wrong. It doesn't matter. Everybody comes up to the board at some time. And I take those kids who are really, really struggling. Maybe they have a model they get to come up to the board and present their model, take questions and comments and sit back down. So I'm finding areas for everyone to work through it. Kids who are too scared, I'll take their journal and say, can I share your idea? And slowly they'll start coming up. And then we come up with a summary. Hey class, what did we learn today? What did you learn today? What were the most important parts of the lesson? And you'd be surprised some of the struggling kids, those are the kids who come up with the summary. You know, oh, I learned that if you use Johnny's way, or I learned if you use Andrea's way, that's much quicker and you're going to make less mistakes. Great. Let's all write that down for our summary and now reflect personally. What was hard? What worked for you? How did your partner partner participate? So it's, it's not about the math. It is about the math and it is about the learning, but it's also about how do we talk to each other? And we, and I go over, there's like, (laughs) even idea, don't say that. It's like, you disagree with the person's idea, not the person, right? So you could say, I, I like how you worked really hard. However, I disagree with you. I don't think three plus two is, is four. I think you might've made a mistake. Do other people agree with that? What do we think? Is it okay to make a mistake? Where do you think she made her mistake? Huh, do you agree with this person? So it's empowering them that the mistakes are just part of a conversation. And in a model, mm. this is how we talk to each other. And I model myself making a lot of mistakes. I'm always talking. And if I, and if, if it's at the beginning of the year, I purposely make a bunch of mistakes just so I can say, oh, I made a mistake. Look at that again, making mistakes all the time. And it just kind of builds, slowly builds this culture of, oh, right. 
And I kid you not, I had, so I was teaching second grade and I had a, a student who could not add, who could not write all of her numbers. And she came up to share her model and the class went crazy. They all know she's in resource. They all know she's a part of special education. Nobody makes fun of her. Nobody talks, but she was super shy. She never wanted to share ideas. And it was mid-year. She came up and the kids were like, yay, yay. You know, even the not nice kids. Because they knew they were, they bought into this is, we're really excited for her. Like we are in this team together and I call it a team. Get in the game, get in the game. And if you're, being distracting and pulling all their people away from their learning and you don't care, you may go sit in the back, come back and join us because we're usually at the front. Come back and join us when you're ready to learn. You have that agency, right? Because I don't have time to deal with your behavior right now. Get in the game. This is fun. You want to be here. We're having a good time Um, because they do. They have like, if there's somebody who presents something where the answer is 42 and someone presents something where the answer is 38, I won't tell them who's right they got to figure it out and discuss it with each other and they get excited and heated and um you never know who's right you never know who's wrong and i don't call them the kids who are always right all the time i call those the ringers i'll save them for when the conversation gets stuck and then i'll be like mm, what do you think kira <laughs> so it's it's very keeping keeping what's happening in the class all the time and trying to keep it a level playing field i'm hearing you say a lot of communication um, a lot of empathy, um, mm -hmm. bringing in that morning meeting and whether that's, you know, social emotional learning that's happening there and having it throughout the day. It's not just that 20 minutes of the day. Um, when I was teaching at this, at one school, one elementary school, I had the fortune of, um, being involved with them because they did six weeks. The first six weeks of school was all relationship building. There was no academic for six weeks. It was awesome. And then we would, I mean, the teachers would throw in some fun things that, you know, they're, they're learning a couple academic or they're doing some math games or they're doing some, you know, social studies trivia or whatever, but we did it in a sense that it was like relationship building. And, um, and the math teacher there, he had these cards that were basically like, here's the language that you can use to have certain conversations. And I was like, wow, those are fantastic. So I, I got a copy from him and then I actually used them throughout the year and I posted them on my wall. Like, you know, if you have a disagreement, here's how you can disagree. And if you agree, here's how you can agree politely and, you know, so on and so forth. We went through all these different scenarios, but we didn't just have them posted on the wall. We actually practiced them. We explicitly practice how to speak to one another. And by mid-year, you would just hear kids using language that they didn't use before. And it's on our walls and they're just naturally using it. And they were able to get through, you know, disagreements without insulting one another or calling somebody dumb or whatever. And that empathy was starting to be there and that open-mindedness was starting to be there. So I, what I'm hearing from math is language and communication are huge. Huge. It's part of the mathematical practices, right? So we have to persevere and solve questions, but we also have to critique and analyze each other's thinking. And that's a big one. And we do, we start with those sentence um, starters. You know, if you agree with someone, I agree with you because that's that magic word, right? Or I disagree with you because, and here's why, or I'd like to build on to so-and-so's thinking. So those are actually glued into their notebook as well in there. And the same thing, if someone says, you're wrong, it's like, let's reframe that, right? I disagree with you because, and you, again, you practice it a couple of times and then it gets ingrained. And you know what? It transfers to English language arts. It transfers to science. It transfers straight ahead so just to all the subjects. So to life. I mean, yes. that's how Jen talks. <laughs> I have heard Jen talk through some pretty heated situations and she uses language just like that. Right, Jen? Yes. And <laughs> that's a yes. big one too. That, the that is a good one. Jen. Yeah. That's one of my favorites. Yes. And, and it, it really, what it's so interesting because I always thought that you know, there was like the, the math or, you know, the, the right brain, the left brain. And, you know, even though that's, you know, an oversimplification, but to realize that using math as a way to actually practice social, emotional learning, and because it seems so concrete and it's so objective, you know, well, 
you know, as an English teacher, well, why did I get a, a B on my paper and someone else got an A or this or that? Whereas in a um, parent-teacher conference, well, the reason why they got an 82 on this math test is, and right. it's so easily quantifiable, but what I'm hearing you say is not necessarily, like it's it's not that answer, it's the process. And um, to me, like, it, it makes me wonder then, like, how, how do you, and again, we, we didn't even get to these questions yet, but like, how, how would you then go about grading a student? Because if a student can get the right answer all the time, but they haven't really learned anything as far as those types of skills that you're trying to foster, whereas another student is really leaning into this practice that you're trying to build. And they're really trying to think math, but they're getting answers wrong who gets the higher grade do like how how do you attach a, a number to all of that that's, well it's mostly all- a rubric you know what i mean and we're looking at um and you you have to work with teachers to create the rubrics what are you looking at are you know the mathematical practices have to be part of the grading right so the kid who is asking questions the kid who is making viable arguments definitely if we're just going for a straight test, I always have kids show their thinking. They have to show what their brain is doing. So the kid, and it's usually like a point for the thinking and a point for the correct answer. So if a kid mm-hmm. writes the correct answer, they only get one out of two. If a kid shows all their thinking and gets the wrong answer, they get one out of two. If the kid does both, they get two out of two. So it's way, it's it's weighting both of the arguments because I'm telling you so many kids have great mental math skills, but they haven't learned how to write their thinking, which is definite, they, they're just, they haven't learned that language of putting it down on their paper. It needs to be modeled. It needs to be authentic and not like some fabricated thing. Um, but that is just as valuable as the answer, you know? And then if they have their thinking and they have the wrong answer and you hand it back to them and say, I will give you another point if you can find your mistake and fix it. Find your mistake, that's one point find your mistake and fix it, there's another point. So you you just got one, you have a possibility to get one more to find your mistake and one more if you fix it. So you're rewarding, you know, that, the, the perseverance. So as you're talking about scoring and rubrics and all that, it, I always go back to thinking standardized tests. Mm-hmm. Like I am not a fan of standardized tests. I will give them because I have to as a teacher, but I'm not a fan. So like, for instance, when I was, when I was moving, I was looking for schools and for my kids and I'll ask people, well, is it a good school? And they'll say, well, yeah, they got great test scores. <laughs> like, that doesn't tell me it's a good school, you know, or if somebody asks me, is it a good school? I'm like, well, I have different standards than some people. Like I'm not looking at just test scores. So right. what is it that you're looking at that tells you if it's a good school? What do you want to know about it? Um, I'm wondering how do we, how do we get the general public and whomever else is driving those standardized tests and like, look at those scores. How do we get the word out there that that isn't, that isn't evidence of anything really, as far as learning goes and high quality, right? It's evidence of how well those kids take the test and that yeah. they're socioeconomic usually standing. Um, I don't know. That is a really, really good question. I think the way you get people to schools is word of mouth about the teachers. Cause I think it's really, um, and also looking at the curriculum, but even if you have, I work with teachers who have horrible curriculum and I teach them how to flip it and use it in a way that you're not hurting kids. Because I do believe if math is taught incorrectly, you are damaging kids. You're damaging their self-esteem. You are damaging their opportunities to make mistakes and learn from it. So I'm really clear about sure you have a terrible curriculum but I can tell you how to use it so that you're you're growing kids and it's gotta I I think you know when I left the classroom and I brought my son to the mountain school where I live it's got lower scores but I went in and I talked to the teachers and I was like oh I like what's going on here right they are big into social emotional they are big into community they do all these things I was like let's do it watched a couple teachers I think you gotta look but again, a, a bunch of parents aren't educated in what's good teaching these days. Hmm. You know, what they think is good teaching, what they had, well, I got through it. I'm not yeah. sure it's good teaching. 
I, got I found you. the schools that had the really high SEL and big community where I've sent my kids actually have higher test scores. They're right up there at the top of the district with, with the others that are doing the, you know, drill and kill and push, push, push. So. And I would love to see those kids' test scores in, in a couple of years once they're older. Because your school went to eighth grade, right, that you were teaching at in California? That one did, yes. And then, of course, there was the one in Campbell uh, that my kids went to for elementary K-5 that was also similar. Right. Because my when I worked at the school that I worked at that was concept-based, for a long time, we had the bottom scores, right? Common Core came, we started slowly climbing up. Things, Different things were emphasized. But then we tracked those kids. Who went into the advanced math in high school? It's not the kids who did the drill and kill. Yeah. They don't like math. And they don't know how to think. It's the concept kids that are like, ooh, ooh fun, let's go. You know? Yeah. My daughter came out of concept schools all the way from K-8. And she's actually still in a concept school. We found one up here uh, for high school. Awesome. And she's she's in her math class. She's like, She tells me it's her favorite class. And I was like, last year, it was your least favorite. I go, how you doing in it? And she's like, I'm doing great. I learned all this last year. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I had a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> and I, maybe we should talk to your teachers and see how we can push you a little bit so you're actually learning something now instead of just you know showing what you've already mastered right um, it sounds like though she has confidence um yes you know and I, I told her I said I'll, I'll let that ride for a couple of weeks because I like that you're feeling confident and comfortable and you know you can ride with it but at some point throughout the year you're going to have to start pushing again and get to that discomfort level because you know that's just that's part of learning so right anyway. Right, and I'll go into a classroom and I'll say, here are the rules of when I come in. You ha the most important thing is you have to make mistakes. How do we feel about mistakes? And the kids will go, we learn from them. And I go, no, really, how does it feel? And they're like, horrible. I'm like, I know, let's be real. It's at first, you're like, oh, I made a mistake. It feels horrible. But I kid you not, a couple of months in, you, you really model, you really demonstrate the love that's gonna come from those mistakes, the joy, the celebrations that come from the mistakes. And the kids all of a sudden are like, eh made a mistake oh, I can't believe I did it again ah. but you know, thinking thinking of that though you just reminded me that you know that they've learned to just kind of say we love mistakes right um because that's what we say at school but it's not always passed down to the house right I mean you think about the generations like in the 1950s and how our parents were raised it, no you did not make a mistake right and so and so there's many people that are parenting now as I am that are still in that mindset because that's how they were raised. And so um, when one of our questions is how do we bring all of this conversation into schools? How do we bring the social emotional learning into schools so that in math, these kids can feel safe and comfortable? And then how do you bring it home too is a bigger question, right? Well, I think it's that parent night. I really think a lot of schools are scared to get in with the parents and afraid the pushback and the questions. Um, you know, I worked at a very elite public school, let's just say that in California, like very high, a lot of money, very affluent, a lot of tech people with strong opinions and nobody wanted to touch it. Nobody was like, I don't wanna get a room with those strong parents. And I'm like, but they could be on our side if they knew this is what we're doing. And every time, even those people I presented, this is what we're doing. This is how you're teaching your kids. They could release and relax a little. You know, because I think they're still in that got to get ahead, got to get ahead. Johnny has got to go to Stanford and be a doctor and blah. That's great. Johnny's in second grade. Let's take it down just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I not going to get it. I had so many parents be like, well, how's he going to get to Stanford? I'm like, he's seven. No, I know. I had parents. I was in the same, yeah, I know. same area yeah, as I know. you um, before I was at that K-8. And I had parents in kindergarten saying yeah. that. I'm like, this is kindergarten. Um, yeah. So... Let's see. Oh, I just lost it for half a second, but it'll come right back. Um, I was thinking about, oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, while you're thinking of that, I, I, I wanted to, to say that I, I see that as well, as far as having conversations with parents, there's lots of conversations that are admin and teacher or admin and parent or guidance counselor and parent for maybe anxiety, you know, safe screen time or whatever. But there's very rarely are there conversations between educator and parent 
And it's the child that goes back and forth between both of them. Mm -hmm. And to just have more conversations when it's not at an IEP meeting or back to school night or parent teacher conference. Um, but to just have conversations about learning and how we do it. How are they learning at home? How are they learning here? And I, I would love to see where there's more of those. And then you actually get to know Jennifer and not the person who's putting in grades in the grade book. And that's the only reason we ever have a conversation. So Absolutely. big advocate for just talking about education. Yeah. What we're learning, how we're learning. And then also, um, but I, I, you know, I'm a very comfortable with how I teach and I can defend it. And, you know, I'm okay with someone coming, but they're not, I I'm okay with that. A lot of teachers aren't though, and are, are, are scared of, and, and I think having a, a fellow teacher, maybe of the same department there, kind of have a game plan before you go in, not to brace yourself, but be prepared for the tough questions, I think is really important too. Why aren't you doing it this way? You're going to hear that no matter what. Here's my belief. Here's my philosophy. And if you have someone there, it's helpful, you know, just as an ally to say, can you, your turn, now you answer that, you know what I mean? And just have those, like you said, not at a conference, not at a back to school night, just a, hey, come in and see, let's talk about how I'm teaching and how your kids are learning. Let's just have a conversation about it. Um, and if you have questions, specific questions, we can set up time for that later, but let's, let's hold this forum right now. So you're, you're more educated on how your kid is being educated so you can help them. Or mostly I just try and get parents to ease off, you know, stop helicopter, let them, let them make mistakes get up and fly. It's a safe place right now, you know, to do that. Okay, I, Jen, you reminded me of what I wanted to say. And then, and then we're just gonna go real fast with our fast five because we still wanna get that in there. Um, and this has been such a rich conversation. Thank you, Rebecca. Hey. Um, how do you, and, and I, I've been at schools where this isn't a problem, but I'm also hearing this quite often. How do you get the parents involved to come to the parent night? Because a lot of them just are disinterested or they're not reading their emails or they're overwhelmed or they're like, that's not my problem. The school's the one that's teaching my kid. Like, how do you, how do you get them to be involved? So here's what this school did that I was at that I thought was just brilliant. They had, um, so it was a K-6 school. So they had former sixth graders come and run the babysitting in a room next door. Because I think childcare is always an issue. They provided little snackies. Everybody's gonna come for snackies. Um, and we held it once and it like the school board came, those parents kind of came cause they're interested in a couple of other parents, word of mouth. After that meeting, they were like, you, oh, I'm so sad you missed that meeting. I learned so much. We held it again a month later, doubled the people that came. So you gotta get those parents to spread the word because, you know, I can't tell you as a teacher how many newsletters I read that I was sure no one was reading because the parents would be like, you didn't tell me. It's like, I wrote it in the newsletter 500 times. You know who listens? Parents talking to other parents, just like kids talking to other kids. You know, is your mom going? Is your dad going? Cool, we can be in childcare together. My mom said it was really good. You gotta go. And those moms at pickup or the dads, they will spread that word. So you have to be resilient. I'm also wondering because now we're we're online and we're not providing snacks or babysitting. Um, I'm wondering if some of the draw might be like a little survey of what do you want to hear about? What are you wanting to know more about with your kids' school? You know, like really letting the the community and the parents have some um, agency around what's being discussed, so it's not just thrown at them. You know what I mean? Or finding yeah. their pain points. What are your pain points? What can we help you with? Yeah. Um, that might, that might help too. What can we help you with in math? What can we help? I mean, they can, they, you can narrow it down a little bit, but still let them be involved with the structure of it. I think you're going to get more parent involvement if it's via Zoom than ever before. We're on a, I'm on a task force with the school to try and figure out how we can reopen or hybrid or whatever. Usually a task force, there's like eight people, there are 48 of us, 48, because we meet via Zoom and we have breakout rooms and it's five o'clock at night. We can plug our kids in or have them do homework or something else. And more and more parents are there now. I think, I think in this distance learning parents have, they don't have to leave their house. You know, I think you would get a bigger turnout. Yeah, I agree. Our, our task force, we, we, we're a very large district and yeah, we'll, we'll have like 200 on a, you know, district wide, but you know, 200 parents who will want to 
you know, sift through the the slide decks of, of you know, option A, option B, and, and we talk about it and yeah. What's interesting too is that I don't know, I mean, social emotional learning was kind of like, oh yeah, it's important. Now that we're in distant learning, that is the number one thing parents are talking about. And mm-hmm. I'm like, mm-hmm, finally, we see, we got to get our kids together. They are the number of kids depressed, the kids who can't sit still or connect through the screen. Um, you know, my, my son is in fifth grade and he's pretty resilient and he's, you know, pretty happy and watched him for five hours on zoom. And I was like, Ooh, that's not my child. Like he left, like, "Eh." that is not my kid. And I was just like, we're gonna, we're gonna pull this, pull it, we're gonna bring it down a little bit here, buddy, because it's really about nurturing their hearts and they have anxiety. They, they've never been through this. We've never been through this. Their parents are stressed out at home. I mean, I just think it is a scary time for kids. You know, in my high schooler, it's a scary time because they need their people. I need my people. They really need their, because they're done looking at us. Like mommy's not number one anymore. You know, their friends are number one. So, you know, building that peace right now is number one on our task force. How do we provide that for the kids right now? Which is so exciting. So it's a great question. And, yep. you know, looking to um, problem solving as opposed to, you know, c- complaining about this or whatever. So um, circle. <laughs> are, you, are you ready for the fast five? I'll see how fast I can be. My brain's somewhat, somewhat happening now that we've All talked. right, all right. <laughs> You're, we've warmed you up, right? Okay, so I, I, feel that you might've already answered this question, but maybe not, or you'd like to expound upon it. What has been your proudest moment doing your work? And what do you think contributed to that moment? Oh my gosh, proudest moment. You know what, I have to say, oh, there's been so many, there's been so many. Um, But I really think the one parent night where I had a bunch of women crying who stayed after, who said, I was told I was stupid. I was told I was doing it wrong. I didn't believe in myself. I didn't go to college because I didn't think I could do something. And had I been taught math this way, I do believe my life would be different. That to me was validation that everything I'm doing is, is, is correct. And I'm nurturing the students and I'm nurturing the parents and healing the math. There's so much math trauma out there. So many adults, the number one thing is that math. You, the trauma is here and to see it in the parents and then see, oh, I think my stress is causing that trauma in my kid, but you are helping them not have that math trauma. I can get teary right now talking about it. It, I knew I was changing lives right then. And I think just seeing how it changes kids, seeing how it empowers kids and gives them an identity, agency and authority to think of themselves as mathematicians, problem solvers, but really problem solvers, right? not just in math. Beautiful. Here's question two. Can you tell me what you've been the most passionate about lately when it comes to math or just education? I think I'm most passionate, especially in distance learning right now, finding ways for teachers to engage with their students in a problem solving way and not just falling back on, you know, here's this, uh, here's this iPad program or here's this con, this kind of going back to drill and kill. And I'm really blessed that I'm at a school right now that I am continuing to mentor teachers and do it through Zoom, finding a way to do it through Zoom. And then also finding a way to pull those kids where Zoom isn't working for them or this way of learning isn't working for them and making small groups and trying to pull them and create that safe pod for them in that, even though we're still Zoom, although we might be the group pulled back that gets to go into class as a hybrid kind of thing, tester. Um, I'm really Mm. excited about that. So in your work where you're focusing around math and students flourishing with that and their self image and self esteem around math and all of that and doing your uh, consulting work, where did your journey with that begin? Mm, Great question always a math nerd, of course, till calculus. And then I had that 
that principle, but it wasn't until my math specialist went to Japan to study how they teach math over there, came back, started, sh and then she taught it to my daughter's fifth grade teacher. And I went in to watch and I watched my former second grade students who were struggling mathematicians asking questions, fully engaged, not afraid to make mistakes, standing up in front of the class. And I was like, they were doing the teaching, they were doing the learning. And I got myself in that Japan program. So I went to Japan and I studied it there and came back and have been working with the big wigs from Japan, from um, Mills College in Oakland and um, in Chicago from DePaul University. So that, I mean, it lit a fire under me and uh, I have not stopped since that happened. And I've just continued to refine it and learn more and more. I remember talking to you, I ran into you in the hallway at the J when you had just come back from that and you were, you were just on fire, yeah. You energized me, I wanted to go. <laughs> well, I'm telling you to see kids in a math class in Japan where the teacher is like slowly opening the math problem and the kids are on the edge of their seats. And they're not, they're like fifth, sixth graders, like, teacher they're screaming in Japanese and we have it translated like open it more more like they were just so excited to do the next math problem and I thought what is going on with these children like they were on fire and I they were having fun they were engaged in laughing and playing in math and I was like that is what I want for all students so with everything we've talked about I mean you have you have, I, you're so passionate and you have so much that you want to get out there but if you were to run into one person in an elevator and just totally blow their mind with this stuff, you know, you don't have very long in the elevator. I mean, maybe, maybe there's, you know, 20 floors, I don't know, but it's still not very long. So what would you tell them and who, who would you want that person to be? What do you mean? Who would I want that person to be? Like, who do you like, think? Who, most? who would you want to really um, like get into their mind and excite them so that it helps move this along in education so i really think it's it's grassroots because I, I i have issues with the whole system and i think the only way um change is really happening for me is growing it from teachers inviting a teacher to come see what's happening and it lights the spark like i have do you have kids that are struggling in math what if i told you that you don't have to teach math anymore that the kids are going to teach each other what if i told you that struggling kid is going to become a leader um, and feel empowered and ignited and excited about math. You know, come see my classroom because I think once the teachers start changing their practices and test scores, because test scores change, we went from the lowest in the district to the highest. You know, in one year they came and they checked, they thought we cheated. When all the <laughs> teachers in the school started teaching this way, they thought we cheated because the test scores went up so much. And that's what I would say, you know, but I, 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 a top down thing saying to a teacher, this is the way you have to teach now. I don't, I don't think that empowers teachers. When teachers see it, when I saw it and it lit the spark, I want teachers to see it and get inspired. So that, that brings up a question. And I know I don't want to do too many questions because I want to get through the fast five real quick, but you just talked about the top down situation. And I feel like just from being in schools myself, from being in the classroom myself, there are so many teachers there, like you and I, who are trying to do the grassroots and trying to get to spread, but the top down is so strong that you can't. And right. that's part of the reason that I'm a consultant now and not in the classroom, is I am trying to support from the top to get in there and make this change happen, because I wasn't doing it from the bottom. Right. And and I needed 150% of my energy to go to my students because that's how I teach. So right. it was a disservice to my students to try to do this other thing, right? Um, so how, how does that grassroots look then? So here's what happened. We once, so I started at very small schools. I'm at all the smalls in Santa Cruz. It's a one school school district. And their test scores, once I trained all the teachers on how to do this, because I bust in and I model it, um, their test scores rose. So then, the um, head of mathematics, the mathematic coordinator for all of Santa Cruz County came to watch and said, other teachers need to see this. So we had a day of learning where we invited teachers from different schools. I talked to the teachers at the school that I was working with. They came, other teachers came in and saw a live lesson with real kids happen. I gave them a pre-talk like, this is what you're gonna see. This is what they've been learning. Let's go see the lesson, pull those kids journals when they're done, pull the teacher back in and talk about what you saw and what you did. 
everybody who came to that then went back to their principals or sometimes it was a principal or a superintendent and was like, I just saw something crazy. Does anybody want to try it with me? Come in and try it. Then do another one. And it just, it started right before COVID. I was about to burst into about seven different schools, seven different districts from, I presented at a Santa Cruz conference, like math initiative conference. And I did a teaching through problem solving lesson. A bunch of teachers came up from different schools and were like, we want to hire you at our school. We're sure of it. Then having the teachers come and see it in actual classrooms, same thing. How can we make this happen? So they got to see it. 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 So what I heard you say is that you had at least one administrator to start with, though, to get you into that school. And then from there, it kind of goes grassroots through the teachers to teacher. And then and because that one school is doing it and not just one teacher is doing it, then the other principals are like, oh, okay, let's take a look. Well, the way I shot myself to the school was the very first one. I said, oh, I'm looking, you know, I'm looking at your test scores and it seems like you know, your kids are really good at arithmetic. Do they know how to think? And the teachers were like, no, they bombed that part of the test. I was like, what about if I told you, um, cause I had them take a Mars assessment and then we analyzed it. I'm like, let me come in and let's analyze your Mars assessments. And like, hmm, I don't really understand what they're doing, do they? Mm -mm. What if I told you I had a way to solve this problem and let me show you what it looks like. And I, and they're like, you can come in and do that in each of the classes. I'm like, I would love to, cause I love teaching. I, that's what I miss about being a consultant. I'm like, let me in your classroom, give me your kids, let me go. Um, and that's how it really grew. That is how it all started was a free, hey, let me look at those Mars. Let's look at, let's analyze some Mars tasks. And they were like, we want to go. And that now all those teachers are trained they are on their own. We did bet. We changed the way their benchmarks. We changed the way they do report cards. Everything is different out there. So wow, you are just. A, bring. You're a powerhouse. Ah, yeah. I just want to. Can super passionate. I need to have it. like. There needs to be a like a Rebecca pill that you can take <laughs> and just like put put you in like infuse it into people's DNA. That's oh. when you go to one of Rebecca's Zumba classes and it just becomes infused in you. <laughs> yeah, yeah we got one last now. question we got one last question um and we might have already answered it i mean the question is about Pretty how do much. we bring this conversation into schools and and then what would the ideal outcome be so we've talked a lot about how to bring this conversation into schools with the parent nights and then you know the grassroots and getting it to spread like that and you going in and actually sampling it in, in classrooms but what's the out ideal outcome aside from you know of course their test scores going up and and uh changing benchmarks and whatnot like what what is the overall outcome that you want the overall outcome I want is that teachers have a better understanding of what they're teaching. Like they, you know, I think a lot of us, when, when I started teaching this way, uh, teach, I was teaching second grade at the time and teaching comparison problems. I was like, I, because there's a whole study aspect that goes along with it. I was like, I've been teaching this wrong for years and I don't really understand what it is. And it's second grade, first grade. So I love when my idea is that teachers grow in their content knowledge and kids grow in their content knowledge and teachers grow in, in how they're sharing that knowledge and empowering their kids. And like you said, taking that social emotional learning into every subject of the day and giving kids that opportunity to have agency, to be, to see themselves as, you know, mathematicians or writers or whatever. I mean, we always say that writers work. If writers come down, you know, but once they really feel it and they're like, I'm a writer, I'm a mathematician. Uh, that my ultimate out outcome is that, is that yeah. I am ready to take on the world. I am ready to make mistakes and feel comfortable with it. And if I don't get it one way, I'm going to try another way. And then I might phone a friend, you know, but I'm gonna, I'm in control of my learning. I am in, I am in control. Yeah. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah. And Jen and I, some of what we do is we go into schools and other organizations and we really support bringing that social emotional learning into everything, you know, making it, I like to say, making it part of our DNA, making it part of our culture and who we are. We live it. It's, we right. also teach it explicitly, but we live it. Right. And that, and that goes through to any, any subject matter. So I love that you're doing that with math and that math is trickling out to life skills. Right not just math. I think that's the, the hard thing. Teachers go to a workshop, they get a one day thing, they get a one time to bring it back to their classroom. But the question is how do we change our practice so it's woven in to the structure of everything? Yeah. So I think we're definitely on the same, same wavelength there. So what so, questions do you have for Jen and I? Sorry, Jen. Oh, yeah, I was just gonna say that, that, that 
that question that you had, um, cause we, we love questions and wondering what you would want to ask us knowing our passions and what we yeah, How do you in. teach teachers to weave it into everything? Are you modeling that? Are you, do you have a, like a handbook for them? What are you guys using? For which? For teaching teachers how to have the social emotional learning go throughout the day in every subject. Is that what you guys are doing? Is I wrong or is it like kind of changing the way you present material? Right. So, so what I've been doing is doing a lot of resilience work, especially right now with COVID and um, where it's, you know what, it's, it's almost like the way you're, you're teaching math with the students where it's problem solving and it's less delivery of content, but exploring those tools. So mm-hmm. personally, what I've been doing is me less teaching, but if you can read a slide deck and here's the tools, read these different things. How do you imagine using this in your classroom? How might you imagine students benefiting from this particular tool and and let them envision it and let them see it? And then when they see that, there's a buy-in and they're like, okay, well now I want to integrate it. And then they start brainstorming those strategies. So that's what I'm doing where where Heidi and I, when we, um, well, when we did Penn too, right? where we, we just literally had a slide, time to play. And so to create that curiosity and wonder, that's what, that's what right. I've been doing. That's what, Heidi, what, what have you been doing for, for the SEL? So I also add in a lot of like mindfulness practices and self-reflection and kind of just that, that well-being and learning to love ourselves so that we can then go love each other um, along with the tools of communication using that uh, self-love and empathy for others. So that creates that safe environment. And then, and then that, I think that's the piece that threads throughout the day, you know, in addition to the questioning strategies that Jen's talking about and keeping that curiosity going, you know, between the two of those, you can do that anywhere. And it, and it just leads to life skills really. So I do specifically teach life skills to children and to adults, um, you know, if they, if the organization wants that, um, I, I teach specific classes, but also just teaching them how to infuse that into their day, day to day. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. And how are you guys getting into class, into schools? Well, that that is what we're endeavoring to do. A lot of it is through the conferences that we've been designing um, mm-hmm. and those relationships. I think a lot of it is building the relationship with the people first. And Mm -hmm. then once they, they see and understand who we are, what we're about. Um, So it's, it's not that, you know, cold call type of experience, but it's more about, oh, well, you know, this person, oh, well then if you know them, you, you know, this and that. And so it's those, those connecting pieces, I think. Right. Right. Yeah. And before the pandemic, I was, I was in some schools before the pandemic, um, but since the pandemic, it's just kind of turned out that we've been more in organizations than schools, but the organizations we've been working with, like Head Start, for instance, and the Children's Guild are all organizations that are trying to move education into this direction, and um, we've been doing a lot of conferences with them, so we're, we're kind of behind the scenes, but we're, we're in that direction of, you know, moving people along, getting the word out. And that's why, that's part of why we decided to do the mugs and hugs series. Cause again, it's just another way to get the word out. And the more you get the word out, the more people want to do it. And, and that's our bottom line. That's, that's, you know, our ideal outcome is that schools transition into this style of teaching and um, engaging with children in a really safe and social emotional type of way in every single subject. Right. And so, you know, to that end too, we love doing the mugs and hugs and getting more people on board, forging those relationships with you doing math and, oh, you know what, if you're trying to change the culture as far as this and that, oh, you got to find out, you know, Heidi and Jennifer. And we, if we get in and we're like, oh, you know what would be a really if one of their missions is to really have student-centered learning so students can flourish, well, you know who the math person is, it's Rebecca. So to that that end, how can people find you if they're like, oh my gosh, she's amazing. We got to have her in our class. You can go, I have a website called youcandoitmath.com. So www.youcandoitmath.com. 
it gives you a little more information about me, my teaching philosophy, what is teaching through problem solving, um, some ideas for workshops and, uh, but everything keeps growing and changing. And uh, yeah, feel free to email me. You can get my awesome. email address there. Awesome, there. thank we, you. We will make sure that we put your website and your email address in the description of this video on our YouTube channel, our Mugs and Hugs YouTube channel. So people can find you there. And we will also make sure that you have the video to put out on your uh, social media. I will, I definitely will. I think it's all a right. great time for all of us to be spreading this out to the universe. So thanks, thanks for coming for today, Rebecca. Guys. How fun, super fun. Cheers. All right, oh, put your mug up. And I, I can't do that, but I'm my thing, I love to take my little picture. So three, two, one, and... Yay. Thank you. Bye, Bye, Bye everyone. Have a great day. I got to go see what's happening inside. I'm a little.